everybody, welcome back to Calabunga Corner. In today's episode, we have with us Pat Fraley, who was the voice of Krang, Baxter Stockman, and several other wonderful characters in the cartoon series. Thank you for joining us today. The original one. Yes, the original cartoon series. I'm older than death. <laughs> I, I'm beyond middle-aged. I'm like the walking dead. Ooh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the walking dead. Krang really did kind of seem like he was walking dead since, you he know, was, he wasn't in a body. He was bouncing for the first few shows, I think, before he got his android body. What inspired you to get into voice acting? I was better at it than Shakespeare, you know? It was less inspiration, more, well, they like me there and I'm better. I started uh, you know, my career as an actor in Australia doing Shakespeare. And someone called the theater company and said, uh, do you have anybody who does a James Cagney impression? They went, oh, yeah, we got a Yank in the company now. They figure we all sit around bars and do impressions each other. You do Betty Davis and I'll do Humphrey Bogart, and then you do me doing Humphrey Bogart, you know. And so I went to this uh, uh, studio to do some commercial, uh, uh, and uh, you, Daddy Rat, you need us, you know, get a shop at Reynolds Street Arcade. And I did it, and they paid me 75 bucks uh, screening, which was about 120 bucks American. And that was what I was getting weekly at the rep company doing Shakespeare. So I thought, gee, this is a very good balance. And uh, one of them made a comment, oh, <clears throat> yeah, you can, uh, you're great. You're bigger than the other actors. We can't get them to get that big. And I went, oh, great, because I was always known as like, more is not enough. Pat, bring it down, you know? And so uh, I just started doing more and more, and they kept hiring me more. And, uh, that's the way God kind of put me in that path as far as performance. It's really great that you were able to get into acting that way. The voice acting just kind of pulled you that way. Yeah. What was your first major role, lead or side character? Uh, the first major role, the first series that I got as a, as a regular was uh, um, The Incredible Hulk. And I got this, uh, and I was Major Talbot, the guy after him. Straighten that tie, mister. That's army property. I was like the turgid, tough guy in that. And uh, that, then I was off and running because around that time, He-Man was introduced. And He-Man uh, was filmation and 65 episodes. In other words, all afternoon original cartoons, five days a week. Well, before that, all cartoons were Saturday morning. And Scooby-Doo, for example, was only a 13-week buy. So we do 13, week, two, 13 episodes, and they'd play them four times a year. My math is not that good. And that would come out to a whole year. Well, all of a sudden, there's 65 episodes that are bought to cover a quarter, and then they would be repeated during the year. Wow, well, He-Man hit some kind of incredible share of market. There was a whole market of kids coming home from school who wanted to see cartoons, not wait till Saturday morning, and bam. There were only about 20 or 30 of us in Los Angeles that could deliver three different characters, sounding characters, in a 22 and a half minute show. And, and we had no guests then, so we had to do the duck, the dog guard, and the extra B, you know, for the same amount of money. So we were working like crazy, you know, we were doing eight, nine shows a week, different shows, and uh, that was a real golden age for animation as far as uh, the work goes, the, the work. And we got to uh, learn on the job because wow. they didn't have anybody else. So we go, who's, got a, who's light on their contract? Meaning we had two, not three voices. They didn't want to pay for another contract. And I, you know, I'd raise my hand. Okay, you're the Asian professor. I, I can't do Asian. You do now. <laughs> so it was like, wow. You know, it was trial by fire. But... Uh, that was an era that lasted into the 90s with these great 65 episode uh, buys. Did any voice actors help coach you in any way that you can recall that really helped you out? Well, they, they're, it's such a uh, generous world. The first job I did, which was Scooby-Doo Goes Hollywood, which was uh, uh, reviewed in a variety of Scooby-Doo, Doo, Doo. Um, uh, afterwards, Frank Welker came over to me and said, you know, I love your voices. Why don't you come hang out with me at the comedy store? I mean, I was just new in town. We're the same age. He'd been here for 10 years before. I'd been all over the place. And uh, it was just so generous. And uh, of course, I learned by watching them. I mean, uh, I'd be in a show with Mel Blanc, Captain Caveman, and uh, the engineer says, Mel, do your baby. You know, they had to need me to baby. And he picked his handkerchief out of his pocket. I used my kid. And, 
And I was whoa. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah, that is. Jewish baby. <laughs> Italian baby. <laughs> I cover babies in sitcoms sometimes when they won't cry on cue. But you, you learn that way because you see all these brilliant people. And I was around for the first generation of voiceover people. Literally, they were the first. Um, Dawes Butler, Mel Blanc, June Ferre. We were all doing shows and I was, they called me the kid till I was 35. Wow. I thought, that's a good deal to call me a kid at 35. But now I'm 62 and I do 80 year olds. So it's, you know. I'm getting the payback. Uh, but uh, besides, you know, modeled, you know, uh, work modeled, I've had mentors that came along my way, and that's the way you really learn. I mean, I went through six years of college and really two years of internship in uh, Australia, and uh, really mentors are the way you learn. And once in a while, you know, I mean, ha how many teachers you had that were really good, one or two, that just really encouraged you and were terrific? And so um, Ron Feinberg was, um, Ed Asner has been a, a mentor and a dear friend um, my whole career, uh, pretty much. I've been here 32 years in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, Chuck Glor, you know, that really advanced me. They took an interest and in, uh, I tried to be a good student and do everything they told me to do. How did you get your roles, and I mean roles, as in all those different roles on Ninja Turtles? Well, uh, Fred Wolf was pretty frugal, the producer, and uh, we didn't have guests, and so we just were allocated the roles. The writers are very productive, uh, and they came up with characters, and we fulfilled them every week. And we didn't know what character, you never, rarely do you know what your guest role is, or certainly in those days you didn't. You know what your, your cast roles were, like I had Bird, Bird Thompson, Bird and go, 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 right? And then I had, uh, originally for a few shows, Baxter Stockman, Baxter Stockman, the fly guy. And then, uh, but he died off. And then I had uh, Casey Jones. Uh, I also had things like uh, Ray Filet. Was my bad Marlon Brown though, Ray Filet? I, can't, I gotta go, you know. <laughs> yeah. I loved doing that. And uh, we'd have him come in and come out and do, and we would, we would be the guest characters on it, besides our regular stock of characters. How did you first hear of Ninja Turtles? Uh, I went to the audition ostensibly to, to replace, I didn't know this at the time, to replace the director who had cast himself in four major roles. Now, it's tough doing two, let alone three, let alone four. I can't pull off four, uh, really, in a 22 and a half minute show and have them separate, meaning sound different than each other. So I came in and Fred Wolf said, um, here, what's your, uh, this is the, the, the copy. This is, uh, I want you to do this. We got, and I went, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I thought, God, that's stupid. That's never going to go anywhere. Right? And I went, Krang, an evil, bodiless blob of a villain, crafty, but funny. I went, whoa. And I said, can I have a couple minutes with this? And, and Fred went, uh, yeah, you have two minutes, and we have to go. So I thought, oh, gosh. And I've taught my whole career. So I thought, well, okay, now, don't panic. Any given character can be broken down to its six elements. Pitch, pitch characteristic, tempo, rhythm, placement, mouth work. What I'll do is I'll choose an element for each of these uh, attributes or description points and I'll just marry them together and pray that I come up with something that's interesting. So I said pitch. Well, I'll have him a high pitch, but he can vary quite a bit so he can be crafty. And then I said uh, uh, pitch characteristic. I'll have him a little bit cottony sounding. Tempo. I'll have him vary so he can be slow or he can be very fast. That'll add to the villainy. And then uh, a rhythm. I'll give him an undulating rhythm because he's a blob. And then getting down to placement. I'll make it the back of my throat because it's kind of blobby and mouth work. I'll do a little bit of puffy stuff and maybe uh, he's disgusting. So I'll, I'll burp. No, I'll, they'll never let me burp between the lines. I have to burp on the lines. Right? Like when I get upset and, with my boys, I go, you just do it. And I get heartburn, so, you know based on reality. So, all right, Pat. Pat Fraley, crying take. So, how would you like to be sauteed in oil with just a touch of cilantro? That was it. <laughs> so it turned out that I, uh, I was cast in four characters. Um, uh, uh, Krang, 
Bern Thompson, Vernon, and Baxter, the fly guy. And I did I did the first show, can't remember, or before we started, I said, I just can't do four. I can't pull it off. Three. And so, yeah, and they gave uh, Vernon, thank goodness, to Pete Renaday, who did just this incredible job. At, it was such a great instrument in the orchestra. And, uh, I, I, and they, he got rid of the director because he, it's a good, when you're a director, don't cast yourself in too much. <laughs> good lesson, because that was a 10-year ride for us, I think. Yeah. 200 shows or something like that. Uh, did you record with other voice actors in the studio with you? Always. We all, well, you know, they, in those days, if somebody went on vacation or somebody had some difficulty, they would record them wild. And then one of us would dummy it. In other words, we would do the same rhythm as the actor, pretty much, or do an imitation of their voice so the animator could continue on. And then they would, uh, well, if the, if the actor could record on vacation or something, then they had their tracks, right, separately. They had to be, uh, they had to be edited separately anyway. But if the actor, we had to wait, the actor would actually listen to the person that imitated their voice and do an ADR looping. They'd see, you know, a uh, crane going, uh, I am crying by another person, and then you'd, I am crying, and you'd match the lip movements. Okay. So, there were two, but basically getting back to what we were wild, but most times we were all there in the same studio, the same room for years. That's really cool. It was wonderful. Yeah. Better to be able to bounce off each other than stand there and just look at the screen with the beeps. Oh yeah, or, or, or record it alone because you have to guess at how the other actor would initiate a line so you could respond to it. Usually ensemble work is better that way. Uh, how often did you guys do recording for the Ninja Turtle series? I think once a week. We get behind, it's tough for the animators to keep up and the writers, but I think, I think it was once a week. And was there a lot of ad lib <clears throat> and probing done on the show? That's it. I'm glad you asked that question because <clears throat> we all sat in the same place. It was like going to the third grade for 10 years when we had our seat. I was next to Rob Paulson. I never had any, I think I had two shows with him. I think I might have had two lines between Raphael and Craig. They just didn't, you know, usually it was Leonardo saying something if we were with the Turtles, because many of the shows we weren't with the Turtles. We were in the Tactodrome or something like that. But Rob and I are really big on improvisation and um, changing lines, you know, uh, you know, we just love it. And so we would be there like third graders going, and we would literally get to the point where we'd write down ad libs for each other and dare each other. Here, no, 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 go ahead, do it, do it. And the first season, there was a, we did a lot. Uh, I don't recall the other actors doing a whole lot. Really, Cam uh, stayed to it. He was sort of the boring turtle. He always said, I never get anything funny to say. I'm the hero boring turtle. And uh, a very uh, background in theater didn't vary too much. There were some, but we were all over the place, R R uh, Rob and I. And the first season, we got away with murder. I, the line that I did, I just demonstrated when I, when I was talking about auditioning, how would you like to be sautéed in oil with, a, with just a touch of cilantro? That line was written as, how would you like to be boiled in oil? And Rob went sautéed with a touch of cilantro. That's not even my ad lib. And we, we actually got known for it and were hired on Bobby's World to do the same thing as far as work together and ad lib little sequences, Howie Mandel. Uh, cast us after that because he liked the way we work. We're kind of like writers. And, uh, but then after it became this huge success, all of a sudden they clamped it down. And we had to like, throw out three ad libs to get one. It was like union arbitration. Oh. They really clamped down. But the first season was important to, because what was unique, I think, about the show, and only because of the boys, you know, uh, Barry Gordon, Cam Clark, um, um, Townsend, Coburn. Townsend and, uh, and uh, Rob, they really tapped into the sound of kind of real teenagers. Now they were teenagers with a mortgage, as we call it. They were older, but they tapped into that sound. The writing tapped into it too, but they really lend, because that was kind of the unique thing, is that they sounded like regular teenagers and yet they were turtles. Did you ever get any, any of the collectible stuff of Krang, like any of the figurines or the other characters you did? That you oh, have? well, on a, another show, I got a little figure of, uh, oh, you mean from the producer? From anything, like just for yourself or a memorable 
of being there. Well, you're there. wearing it. <laughs> to, uh, this is they, they, there are only six of these. Were made for the cast. That's Crane's uh, Letterman jacket. And turn around here. Okay. Can you get that? T yeah, it's all embroidered. So we did. I did get that. I probably paid for it though. I can't remember. But uh, then I got a little figure for uh, of a show. Oh, I got some cells along the way. People would. Yeah, I have a collection of cells somewhere around. And then uh, you know, I had a little figurine of uh, Wildcat from Tailspin because I like that character. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't. I don't know where I got that, but. Uh, that's about it for collection. I didn't collect much, and I haven't seen many of the shows. I've probably seen about 10 turtle shows, maybe. Okay. I've seen more on YouTube just bumping into it than I have. Uh, did you have any favorite characters in Ninja Turtles besides for the one that you voiced? Ray Filet. Oh, you mean uh, that other Besi people did? Yeah, that other people did. They all were so wonderful. Uh, I, I, Pete Renaday is such a great actor, and he did Vernon, and he, he was the one that cracked us all up. Because Vernon was like frightened of everything, you know? <laughs> And he, he the, and his lines weren't that funny, but the way he did them, he made them funny. Yes, he did. And yes. so he, I was particularly, uh, we particularly enjoyed him. He's a fun character yeah. overall. So, yeah. Yeah. And I always liked Jim Cummings' work when he would guest, Leatherhead, and he did a couple other ones too. He's always, he's such a wonderful performer. Now, out of the 10 episodes of Turtles, did you have a favorite? Ten episodes. Well, the one you said you've seen about ten. Oh, oh, Any episodes you know, uh... You I like? can't, uh, no, I can't recall. I, I did. Uh, I think I liked Ray Filet, but only one of those things where I got away with murder because I was doing a bad Marlon Brando, and so there'd be a line like, uh, "I have to leave," and I go, "Oh, I gotta go." Right, and it was like barely on the planet. You know, it's like you know how Marlon Brando would, just, you know, I would just, you know, he'd do some mumble, and I and they let me get away with it. So I like that. Getting away with murder. <laughs> we always like getting away with murder. That's what we like the best. We sneak something in. Through talking, I've learned that you've not seen any of the comic books of Ninja Turtles. I've, I've looked, I've thumbed through them. They were beautiful. Okay. I loved them. Did you check out any of the movies that when they came out? No. No, I never saw the movies. I, I have friends that were in them, you know, that did the work. Uh, but I just never was a... Uh, um, Never did. I, I haven't seen much of, of my own work. I've had seen some of it, but I'm not my biggest fan. You know, I asked Ed Asner, who's a, used to, you know, was a well-known actor. I said, do you like your work? And he went, nah. I said, me neither. And he goes, look, I'm 81 years old. Here's how it is. I understand why some people like it. That's as good as it's going to get. And now I realize, I realized after, you know, after a few years, you know when they have actors go, I don't ever see my movies, I will go, yeah, right. But now I do realize it. It doesn't help you. You just remember how many takes you had on that. And, oh, look, you've got a zit. And, oh, the wig is, you know. You, 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 it's hard to kind of forget the process you go through because usually it's strenuous and it's, it's hard, to, hard to forget that part. Okay. I, I did watch some, a few shows, that I, uh, The Tick. I loved The Tick. It was so funny. Yeah. The writing was incredible. And... Um, Tailspin. I've seen a few more episodes because I did Wildcat. But who is this adventure of banana? I forgot. Because I love that, that I got away with uh, doing that character the way I did. They wanted a, somebody to be dumb and they couldn't cast it. So I thought, well, maybe they need innocent. And, uh, and so I played it that way, got it. And uh, the way I did it was pretty, pretty edgy for Disney because the character is a little challenged. Uh, but who is this? Oh, look, there's a new island on the map. Oh, no, it's Guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> He's a little out there, a little drifty, right? Yes. So Disney went along with it. And years later, 20 years later, I started having calls and notes and things from autistic kids and challenged kids that were 20 years old, 21, 22, and said how much that character meant to them. Wow. And what hit me was, and I had no intention of making fun of anybody challenged, right? But when I grew up, I grew up around the deaf because my grandfather taught the deaf and blind. And a lot of times they have difficulty and they're challenged. So I had this innocent that was sort of like that. When you hear it, it sounds a little bit like he's tone challenged. I didn't know it, but what they did these kids that go to public school because that's where they have the resources for someone with autism, Asperger's, they didn't even know what to call it 20 years ago. 
They were, the public schools, well, the kids would just belittle them. They would, they're still, to this day, they're so mean to those kids. Well, here they would come home and they'd watch a show where there's somebody that is different that everyone loves. Yeah, yeah, I, I know that. In fact, I have a call to my friend uh, uh, that uh, she's a gal, about 21, and uh, she calls me Uncle Pat, and we have conversations with one every week. And it meant a lot to her when she grew up, to, that, that character. Because somebody w that was different was liked. That's where um, we have a life that's a little more meaningful than just amusement. Did you meet anyone for the first time while working on the Turtle series that you are still friends with now? Oh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, the cast, I pretty much got to know. I, I might have done a couple jobs with Rob before. He's been a dear friend all my life. Cam Clark, I knew, because he's my cousin. <laughs> that, that's surprising. Barry Gordon, no, not so much. Um, Jennifer Darling, really. Uh, yeah, and, and James Avery. Even though we don't see each other all the time, the different cast members, you don't spend seven years or eight, or I spent about seven or eight, I think, uh, and then uh, the Turtles went on for ten. They got rid of Crank, but uh, you, it, there's such a bond. It's incredible. You spend more time with some of your family members. Uh, yeah, I met people that I, I, you know, that are dear to me. Townsend, especially. He called, we're both Christians, and he, he, said, he says, he said, I always uh, appreciated the church of the open car door. Because <laughs> we, we like before we get out, we'd open the door and like, okay, let's pray. Boom. Then we'd go. Church of the open car door. <laughs> Do you have any jobs outside of voice acting? Or has voice acting been able to keep you going without extra work? Um, I've always taught and I've always uh, acted. And acting, and, and the lion's share of that has been voiceover. Um, and character voice work, but I do audiobooks. I was on a sitcom last year, six shows, and I've done movies and stuff. But they, but they really have called for me to work more in voiceover. And teaching has always been part of the mix. Teaching, acting. When I was acting and really nine shows a week, I still found uh, some time to teach. And now I'm finding more time to teach, as they don't need as many. They only need one grandpa per show, right? But I, I have more time to teach and uh, I'm called upon to work less, which that's, is just fine because it's all, it's all in the mix. That's really cool. Yeah. I get better jobs now, though I get to work for Pixar, the Tangled and Monsters, Inc. and Chicken Little and Toy Store. I get, it's cool. The jobs I get are really cool. Is there anything you are doing right now that you would like to share with people that they can look forward to or watch for on television? Well, I don't have anything on my schedule, but I teach in Chicago and New York and Los Angeles, and my website's patfraley.com, and I have a whole page of, there must be a couple dozen, three dozen free lessons. So anyone interested in what I do, go there and enjoy the free lessons on character voice, accents, all sorts of stuff. I also have a page where there's instructional materials they can purchase. So if they live in Des Moines and they can't go to Los Angeles, they can get something that can uh, further their interests. And then I also teach uh, events and workshops in various places. So that's what's come upcoming for me. Is there anything you would like to say to our viewers, the Turtle fans watching this or fans of your other shows? I'm just grateful, you know, to have the opportunity to give you uh, uh, some entertainment and also uh, um, just to imagine you in your pajamas, Indian style, with a Fruit Loop stuck to your forehead. I lowered your ID, IQ rather. I say ID because I have a low IQ. I get them mixed up. They start with I. But I'm sorry because you would have been brighter without me. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on the show. Sure. See you next time here on Cowabunga Corner.